Wow, thank you so much for the uh, extremely kind introduction, Danny. I have to say, this is my first time at one of your events here. It's actually my first time in Western Canada. And I'm just blown away at uh, the friendliness and hospitality of everyone here. I, I'm, for those of you that I've met, it's been a pleasure. For those that I haven't, uh, I look forward to perhaps next year if Danny will have me. Um, so you've also got me really fired up. I'm, I'm kind of new to this uh, Alberta separation issue. And so if you have a referendum, am I allowed to meddle in your elections as an American? I mean, there's precedent, right? So if there's precedent, it's legal. So what I'm going to do here, and, and it, you know, I, before I start, something that really struck me last night. There was a gentleman who asked a question after Patrick Moore's fantastic presentation. And he brought up steroids and said, you know, with the steroid scandal and how it tainted sports for so long, is this climate hustle, this you know, climate hoax, do you see it doing the same for science? And the way I see it, it's much, much worse. With steroids, yeah. It's like, do I applaud because it's horrible, but it's a good point. So here's the thing, with steroids and sports, they were trying to find a way around the system, hoping not to get caught. But with what they're doing to climate science, they are changing the definition of what science is. They're turning science into anti-science. I cannot tell you how many times when I'm quoted in the media or if I'm interviewed, they'll accuse me of attacking science, being anti-science, because I disagree with a conclusion, which is that we're creating a climate crisis. A conclusion is not science. Science is a process, not a result. You know, think back to when you were in grade school. We all learned this. The scientific method. The scientific method is you make observations, you form a theory, a hypothesis, and then you go out and test it. And you try to poke holes in your own theory. And if you can't find any flaws or any holes, you invite others to do it. And if they do it, it doesn't mean you're a bad scientist. You're getting us closer to the truth one way or the other. Science is a process. But now, when they present in this highly politicized environment, this climate hustle, this climate crisis, they claim, if you present science, they say you're attacking science. The same way, I guess, Galileo attacked science, and Copernicus attacked science, and Sir Isaac Newton attacked science, and Einstein attacked science. No, when we challenge the so-called climate consensus, we are performing science, not attacking it. Can we go to our first slide here? I cannot tell you how many times people say, well, look at you. I mean, it's, you're destroying the whole planet for just a pile of gold. And, and the environmental left has this image of us that we're all just trying to hoard some gold like Mr. Burns and the Simpsons so we can sit there and count it away. Well, if that's the case, of course, I mean, a clean environment, we all want to be good stewards of the environment. But it's not about a pile of gold versus the environment. Next slide, please. What's so important is you know, we all want to have a better human condition. We all want higher living standards for people. Higher living standards, better living conditions. So when we have more affordable energy, when we're more efficient, what we have is more money. As you see here, we have more money for housing, good housing, nutrition, education, health care, consumer goods, you know, vacations, things that make our lives happier, healthier, and longer lasting. When people try and say it's greed versus the environment, it's not. It's not. We're trying to make people's lives better. And fortunately, fortunately, when you look at the economics, when people are proposing the Green New Deal or some of these other draconian environmental proposals, when we oppose them, not only are we safeguarding human living conditions, but we're also safeguarding the environment. And I'll get to that shortly. Next slide, please. So how important is it? to be standing up for conventional energy sources, for the oil that's produced here in Alberta and elsewhere. Well, this is a study. This was the Brookings Institution. You're seeing the web uh, uh, screenshot of the front page of their study. The Brookings Institution is a left of center American think tank. So I'm not cherry picking from the Heritage Foundation or anything like that. According to the Brookings Institution, when you replace conventional energy with wind power, your electricity costs double. So if you're used to paying two, three hundred dollars a month, now you're going to be paying about five hundred a month. That means if you're paying about three, four thousand dollars a year, you're now going to pay six, eight thousand dollars per year. Now, if you replace conventional energy with solar power, a little closer. All right. 
If you replace, I'm, I'm rarely told that I talk too softly, so thanks for letting me know. I, otherwise, I would have never known. If you replace conventional energy with solar power, again, according to the leftist center Brookings Institution, electricity cost costs quadruple, four times higher costs. That means you have much less money for health care, for education, for durable consumer goods, et cetera. Now, some folks say, well, James, you know, that was the Brookings Institution, but that was a few years ago. And the cost of renewable energy has come down a great deal. Next slide, please. So this was produced just this past summer. This is the Institute for Energy Research, and they found essentially the same thing. When you replace conventional power with new wind, with new wind plants, new wind turbines, again, you are more than doubling your electricity costs. For new solar power, again, much more than doubling. So their costs have come down a little bit, but they had a Mount Everest of high expenses, and now maybe it's a, a Mount Evans or a Denali or something. It's still much higher than is otherwise the case. And again, this, is have, this has real negative impacts on human living standards. Nobody wants to sentence people to poverty, at least I don't. Maybe the environmental left does. But it's important to keep in mind that if we go on the route of expensive energy, we do have these serious results. Next slide, please. I pulled together this data. This is from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics as well as the Department of Energy. This is oil prices versus unemployment in the United States. But it's true in Canada and elsewhere. And what you see in, in the one line, in, in my screen, it's the orange line. It didn't come out color-wise very well. But if you look to the far left, the top line on the far left, that is unemployment rate. And if you look to the lower line beneath that, those are oil prices. And what you see is so the unemployment rate times 10 to make it uh, match on the graph. So where it says 60, that's 6% unemployment. And then you're looking at oil prices, dollars per barrel. And what you see is a near exact relationship, cause and effect between energy prices and unemployment. And when oil place, prices rise, unemployment rises very soon thereafter and at approximately the same amount. When oil prices fall, the same happens. Now this is true for oil prices. I gave you the, uh, the data for oil, but it's also true for electricity prices, you name it. It's so important that we have affordable energy. This tells us that if we say, well, so what if we pay some extra dollars, in this case doubling or quadrupling our energy prices, so what? So what means people are losing their jobs. People are forced into unemployment. People can't put bread on the table. It's a very serious result that we're looking at. But again, fortunately, it's not energy versus the environment because they're doing a fantastic job safeguarding the environment, which I'll get to shortly. Next slide, please. I'm here to talk about energy and security and climate. So getting a little bit mixing now the energy and security. What you see here, these are the top oil producing countries in the world. And you see Canada at number four. If you want to talk about economic security as well as national security, this is very important. And by the way, we know that the lion's share of that oil production in Canada is happening right here in Alberta. Whether you're part of Canada or whether you're your own nation, you have energy security. And that's absolutely. But it's not just economic security, it's national security. We often hear about how the United States has to send our military to the Middle East because of the oil production there and to safeguard it. When you're producing your own oil here, you don't have to get dragged into wars that have nothing to do with you other than to make sure you have energy. Now, next slide, please. The renewable power, the wind and solar power that we're told we need to switch over to, wind turbines and solar panels are dependent on rare earth minerals. You have to have them. Unlike the oil that's being produced so prodigiously here in Canada and Alberta, this here we see the top 10 countries for rare earth production. Look at the very top, that's China. And look how much compared to the other nations, six times more than the second largest producing nation. And you don't see Canada anywhere on that list. Sometimes people talk about, well, it's, it's grown at home, though you know, we're, we're growing our wind power at home and our solar power. No, but you need the Canadian rare earth minerals to produce your equipment. And your equipment only lasts for 20 years or so, so you're going to need to keep buying it. You become more dependent on potentially hostile powers and more dependent economically on other nations than you would be by keeping with your oil production here at home. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right, I want to show you this quickly and then move on. I want you to hold this thought because I mentioned rare earth minerals and I mentioned the importance of environmental stewardship. I hope we all agree we want a good environment. I know I do. 
That, by the way, is a rare earth mineral mine, one of the few left in the United States. That's taken in California. They largely don't exist anymore because it is among the most, probably the most environmentally destructive activity on the planet. We won't have it anymore. If we want to have more wind and solar power, this is what we're getting all over the place versus what you see here in Alberta where you have a very minimal environmental imprint from oil production. Next slide, please. Sticking with the topic of national security, the most important factor for having strong national security, I mean, hopefully you have the United States friendly nation to the south of you. If you separate, you've got Canada, hopefully good people around you, although, as I was telling my friend Craig Rucker the other day, if Quebec was allowed to separate, we might have a communist nation on our border. That's, that's not a good thing. But the thing is, it's a strong economy that allows us to field a strong military. So you look at the chart here. These are the top economies by gross domestic product in the world. Number one is the United States. Number two is China. Number three is Japan. Number four is Germany. Then the UK, France, India. Let's move to the next slide. Not coincidentally, the nations that spend the most that are able to have a strong defense are the United States, China, Saudi Arabia is up there, India, France, Russia, the UK, Germany. These are all nations that have the strongest economies in the world. If it were a matter of size, the size of your country being how strong your military is, Canada, be the, Canada and Russia would have the two strongest militaries in the world, but it's not the case. If it were a matter strictly of population, it would be China and India. No, it's a strong economy. So if you make sure that you stick by your oil production, your energy production, your strong economy, you don't have to worry about being able to support a strong military. If you switch over to expensive and unreliable wind and solar power and your economy tanks, that is where it's much more difficult to have a strong military and a strong national defense. Next slide, please. In the United States, and, and maybe this will be something that pops up in Canada too, we're often told that we have a border crisis and a border emergency, which they say is becoming a national security emergency because they claim that climate change is destroying crops in Central America. They say that farmers are not able to produce crops and because people are starving and farmers no longer have a place to work, they have no choice but to come to the United States. Bernie Sanders has a platform where he has a certain number of climate refugees from Central America that he's allowing into the United States. Beto O'Rourke goes on a campaign trail and says, it's not due to poverty, it's not due to crime. People are coming to the United States because of what we did, because of our climate sins, because you can't make a living anymore, because your crops are being destroyed. Well, it's all great campaign rhetoric, but you know what? Remember at the beginning of this talk? We have this wonderful thing called the scientific method. When someone says that climate change is destroying crops and that's why we have people flooding the border, guess what? We have data that shows what crop production is doing. So let's put it to the test. They'll say I'm attacking science, but I'm abiding by science. By the way, this particular slide that I have showing, this is from the UK Guardian, and it says climate change is forcing farmers off their land. Next slide, please. And here we have a similar one from NBC News where the subhead is farmers in rural Honduras and Guatemala live on the edge of hunger. And then of course they say it's due to climate change. So Guatemala, Honduras are two big nations, Central America as a whole. Let's look at the facts. Next slide please. This is from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. This is not a right wing think tank. This is objective unassailable data. And what you have is crop production in Guatemala going back from, let's see on my chart, it looks like for the last 100 years or so, but certainly going up to, you see present on the right. Do you see a trend of crop failure that is forcing people off their lands? No, crop production is rising or setting records almost every year and yet they blame it on global warming because they trust that people won't be bothered to look at the facts. But now we know the facts. Next slide, please. Honduras, the same thing, even more striking. You see new crop production records being set every year and yet they say they're coming to the United States and to Canada and elsewhere because global warming's destroying their crops. Simply not true. Next slide, please. And it's not just Honduras and Guatemala. So here I'm going to show you several. I put them in alphabetical order. I'm not cherry picking. I went to the United Nations site. Here we have Costa Rica. Again, we see dramatically increasing crop production. Next slide, please. Ecuador, dramatically increasing crop production. Records virtually every year. Next slide, please. Mexico, the same thing. What do you know? Next slide. 
Nicaragua, the same thing. When people say it's because of climate change that people are forced off their lands, they either, one, are not checking the data and they're simply making things up, or two, they know the truth and they're lying and counting on people not checking the data. I don't know which is worth, which is worse, but this is what we're fighting against in the battle to present science rather than attack it or to redefine it. <laughs> Next slide, please. Panama, same thing. Next slide, please. But what about Canada? Because when I present this data, people will say, well, what about here in the United States? I could present that data, it shows the same thing. Or what about people in Africa? Well, here I am in Canada, soon to be maybe perhaps sovereign Alberta, but let's take a look at Canada. Here we have an article, this is from Federated Insurance Canada. Even the insurance companies are looking for reasons to jack up your premiums and say that you have to pay more because of climate change. According to this article on their website, it says you may have noticed shorter and milder Canadian winters in recent years. It's a growing concern for Canada's agriculture industry. I'm not sure that convoluted logic where you have shorter winters being a concern for farmers, but that's what the article claims throughout. Next slide, please. And you also have, this is from the Weather Network, where it says main concerns for Canada's agriculture are climate change related. The 2001 and 2002 droughts to the floods of, of 2010 and 2011 brought devastation to many crops across the country. And they claimed that that was caused by climate change. Let's look at the data. Next slide, please. Well, what do you know? In Canada, we see the same thing as everywhere else. We have a dramatic increase in crop production. We have records being set each and every year. I know it's hard to see from their seats. It's hard to see even from up here. Yes, in 2001, 2002, there was a very small, you know, decline. Okay, it's a bad year. 2010, 2011, an even smaller dip. But the trend is clear. Anybody who takes a look at that and says climate change is destroying Canadian crops, again, they either don't know what they're talking about or they're counting on you not checking the facts. Either way, we're going to point out the facts here. We're going to point it out everywhere. We're going to make sure people know it's not climate change that's harming crops. It's climate change, if anything, that's benefiting crops. Next slide, please. Okay, actually, go back one more if you would. Okay, so also in that same article uh, from Federated Insurance, it says, as of April 2015, the Great Lakes have already lost about 30 centimeters of their navigation depth, putting a strain on vessels and the future availability of water resources. Now, I highlighted the date of that article, September 2019. So why are they citing 2015? I mean, the data is available. This is what the alarmists do time and time again. Let's look at the actual Great Lakes water levels from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, part of the United States government here. What you see is that on the far right, where you see the top two charts where you see some decline, it is a short-term dip. There's nothing unusual. There's nothing that has never happened before. In fact, when you look at Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, there wasn't any dip at all. They took that short-term dip and claimed global warming, climate change is causing the Great Lakes this dangerous drop in water levels. And yet look what happens in the next few years. We now have more water in the Great Lakes than ever in recorded history. This was the case when they published this article. They knew that to be the case. And yet they said, looking at 2015 data, we see this alarming decline in water in the Great Lakes. Unbelievable, people. Unbelievable. Next slide, please. And indeed, it wasn't just the Federated Insurance website that said this. Here is from National Geographic. And again, they make the same claims. This was back in 20, let's make sure I get the article right. This was back in 2012. Again, talking about declining water levels. Next slide, please. So again, a reminder, we saw what happened since then. So now that water levels are at record levels, do you think National Geographic, who here thinks National Geographic has addressed that topic now that water is at record levels? Of course not. How about anybody else? Aha, I didn't think so either, but I checked. Next slide, please. So here's what they're saying now. Why are water levels in the Great Lakes fluctuating so wildly? <laughs> low, weather, low water levels are terrible. They're terrible. And now that they're setting records, well, we can't say it's a good thing. Why are they fluctuating so wildly? Of course, did anybody see wild fluctuation in the real data? No, of course not. But now that we have record water levels, they want to find a way to make you think that's a climate crisis too. As Mark Morano was telling us yesterday, climate change is the 21st century snake oil. It can do anything. Next slide, please. So getting back to rare earth minerals. And there was a lady last night who asked a question 
um, a, a challenging question about environmental issues. And I, and, and I really don't share her point of view, but Craig Rucker and I were talking with her before uh, last night's uh, dinner presentation, and, and actually she was, she was quite nice and we had a good conversation. She has a strong concern about the environment, and so do I. But what we want to do is we want to employ the scientific method. We want to look at data. We want to look at the facts. So here, again, the photo of the rare earth mine. The Earth Journalism Network published an article, The Dark Side of Renewable Energy. These compounds, talking about rare earth minerals, which are highly toxic when mined and processed, also take a heavy environmental toll on soil and water. From Yale Environment 360, one of the most extreme activist environmental organizations out there, quote, the removal of these elements from the Earth's crust using a mix of water and chemicals caused extensive water and soil pollution. Today, ex uh, today concrete leaching ponds and plastic-lined wastewater pools dot the hills. At one abandoned site, large wastewater ponds are, are sit uncovered and open to the elements. Folks, we will not allow this in Western democratic nations. People won't put up with it. Basically, we're poisoning people in China because their government doesn't care in order for us to claim that we're green and clean and we're reducing emissions. There is more to environmental issues. There's more to being green than simply carbon dioxide emissions. One of them is either eliminating or finding ways to improve rare earth mining. And when we have to do it, we're doing it because we have to. In this case, we don't, not for wind power and solar power, because we have better alternatives. Next slide, please. This is a satellite image taken from Berkeley Earth. And that I took this off my computer screen this morning. And what you see is particulate matter, so basically a proxy for pretty much all pollution throughout the world. And you see on the bottom left the chart. Green is fantastic, yellow is a little bit moderate pollution, and orange, red, or worse. Look at Canada. Look at the United States. Look at the northern hemisphere as a whole much cleaner than Asia, much cleaner than the rest of the world. And by the way, this is, this is not something that's, you know, I'm cherry picking. I took it this morning. But some people may say, okay, well, you know, it's a, it's a Saturday and, you know, what about other data? Let's go to the next slide. I recently gave a talk in Toronto and before going up there, I took this uh, image from Berkeley Earth. By the way, this was taken at 6 p.m. Eastern time on a weekday. So in Toronto and on the east coast of the United States, it, we'd had a full day of pollution, full day of industrial activity, a full day of commutes. And by the way, in Europe and Asia, it's the middle of the night. And still, look at the air quality levels. I share the person's concern last night that we want to have clean air. But guess what? We have the cleanest air in the world already, and it's only getting better. We don't need to kill oil to accomplish what we're accomplishing now. Just a few more before I turn it over to Craig, because the less I talk, the more Craig gets to talk, which is good for all of us. Next slide, please. Before my Toronto talk, I saw this in the newspaper. It had come up uh, just a few months ago. And the headline was, Toronto just set a record for the hottest October 1st in history. And the article, of course, blames climate change and makes it seem like we have this crisis of new uh, high temperature records all over the place. Next slide, please. And yet when you look at the actual data for the highest temperature set in Toronto history, nine of the 10 hottest days in Toronto history occurred before 1990, more than 30 years ago. Only one has occurred since then. When they say that Toronto, or when they say Canada, and they say the world as a whole is having these extreme heat events, it's simply not the case. Listen, high temperature records, low temperature records have always been set and always will be set. But you don't see the trend that they say is, is, is occurring. Just one final note here. Yeah, I know, but Craig's fantastic. I appreciate that, Danny. Danny says, you have a full five minutes, you don't have to rush, but we got the man with a hockey stick. He might come and beat me if I uh, don't get off the stage soon. But thank you, Danny. So the next slide, please. This here is, uh, this is temperature data taken from the European Science Foundation. It was published in the peer-reviewed journal Science Magazine. By the way, I hope you noticed everything I presented here is objective data. We are performing science. We are performing science. Look at the top right graph. That's a temperature history of the past 10,000 years. And as Patrick Moore so very well uh, demonstrated last night, we see that there is a long-term declining trend in temperatures. If you look at the far right of that upper right-hand graph, you see a little squiggly line of temperature increase. That is the dramatic warming 
of the last century. We know that for the vast majority of human civilization, when we had far fewer technologies than today, temperatures were much warmer than today, and guess what? People did pretty well. So did the Earth's ecosystems. That's a fact. If you look at the bottom line, that's or the bottom chart, that's the past 2,000 years. We see the medieval warm period 1,000 years ago when Vikings settled in Greenland. Oh, and by the way, whenever you hear this, because sometimes I hear, well, how about nine of the last 10 uh, years were the hottest on record? That's because they conveniently define, quote, the record. When they say in record, they're talking about the last 100 years. Well, you know, that's the time that we had mercury thermometer networks in this nation and this nation, so that's when it began. It's garbage. Because we do know here in the peer-reviewed literature that temperatures were much, much warmer for most of our history. Next slide, please. And that is confirmed by what you're seeing here. These charts were produced by the United Nations itself. Its very first assessment report shows exactly the same thing. Temperatures today are remarkably cool, not warm. We're getting a little warmer because we're just escaping the coldest period of the past 10,000 years. I sure hope we get a little bit warmer than we are today. <laughs> Next slide, please. I'm going to alert you to something. I've never, ever presented this before, so you're the first to hear it. At the Heartland Institute, I am putting together, along with meteorologist Anthony Watts, if you follow this topic, you probably know who he is. I'm putting together climate, pay, climate at a glance one-page summaries. That's our website. Something's coming really soon. And this is going to be, I was speaking with a friend of mine in the back of the room earlier. You know, how do we get the message out to people? And what we're doing is we're putting together a single page on hurricanes, a single page on crop production, maybe three or four bullet points at the top, short summary, graphs that people can understand, concise. We're sending it to schools. We're sending it to teachers. We're sending it to legislators. And it'll be available for you to share with your family, friends, and everyone else. So next slide. And that is a sample. That's my draft. It's near final on U.S. temperature history. And you'll see I have a few bullet points that give the key points. So if you're a policymaker in Louisiana and you're about to get hit by a reporter with some you know, climate alarmism garbage, you have your talking points. You look at the data. By the way, take a look at temperatures over the past 15 years. What you see is there's been no warming at all. The reason I chose 15 years is that's when we implemented this CRN, is what they call it, the Climate Reference Network. It is one that is immune from heat source, urban heat island corruption. It's the best temperature network in the world. Since it's been implemented, there's been no warming in the United States. Keep this in mind. Write it down, climateataglance.com, and that's where we're going to present that information for you, for students, for teachers, for policymakers. And my final slide, you have my information there. Feel free to reach out to me if you'd like a copy of these slides, any other information, any questions you get. I love to arm people and help people to battle the climate extremists. Taylor at heartland.org. Heck, you can even call me because all you guys, I consider everyone here to be a friend after such a wonderful last couple days. Thank you so much.